I truly hope that you are enjoying what you're listening to, and I hope it's speaking to you on some level, hopefully deeper and deeper as we proceed. But I wanted to say that in this section we'll be talking about transfiguration in samadhi or contact with the infinite cosmic mind. What I'm speaking of and will be speaking of are peak experiences of consciousness, not so much higher consciousness, different gradations of light transmissions or dikshas sent from the universe or the universal unified field, the unified mind. These light transmissions that saints are said to experience, saints and mystics are said to experience, they ultimately need to be grounded with humility, with sadhana or personal spiritual practice, with meditation, with prayer, and by staying in communion with and dialoguing through contemplation with that infinite cosmic mind. So, this is a lesson in humility which I'm sharing with you. Two principles to keep in mind are that all experiences of enlightenment or glimpses of enlightenment, they need to have lasting residual effects and they will have lasting residual effects. However, the powerful effects of an awakening experience or an ongoing awakening experience, it will literally shake the foundation of the ground you stand on in the world and in your interior world. And so it's important to be, again, as I said, grounded in a solid practice of meditation and introspection and self-observation. You can measure the truth or level of truth or the level of light or the quality of light that you have integrated into your being by the increased or decreased level of calmness that is the calmness in the lasting peace that you become. You become a loving presence. So that deep abiding presence of the presence of pure being or God or the unified field is a sign of spiritual progress and a sign of having integrated an enlightenment or glimpse of the divine or God contact experience. And so the second principle to keep in mind is that in those deepening levels of inner peace and inner calmness, not in a frantic, trance-like, frenzy-based state where you are very agitated in, in your spirit and in your biology, but where there is balance and homeostasis. And then being able to, through the inner peace, the experience of inner peace, be actively calm and calmly active, as Paramahansa Yogananda describes in his book, Inner Peace. And the goal of all of this, the goal of any peak experience or God contact experience, is to become, yes, more loving, but also to have spontaneous right action guide your every choice and every behavior and every thought and every feeling. And so the title of this part of our presentation is called God Shock, Transfiguration, Spontaneous Samadhi, the Divine Portal, and Superconscious Bliss. Now, the reason I titled it God Shock is because literally my whole entire system, my whole entire spirit experienced a zap of intense energy, intense love, intense presence. And it did, it did stir my, my soul into charismatic type of aliveness and orgasmic bliss, almost in a frenzied state. And uh, it comes that way sometimes, but most often in this, as a still small voice. But I want to share the song God Shock that I wrote and that I composed. And 
listen to the words and listen to the music and and the vibrations that it gives off because that was the initial experience and then it was following that it's gradually descended into into the spiritual centers the cerebral spinal centers into my nervous system and then into my body thus grounding the experience but as we'll see later this shaking up of my world of of who I was and who I thought I was the world view that I lived in this this fiery intelligent desire consumed me consumed me and it just and it kept being downloaded and downloaded into my hardware and in and my software and my whole programming was changed as a result if you want to call this the pentecostal flame so be it but i don't think the pentecostal flame would cause restless hard to control frantic excitement frenzy for uh, an extended period of time and so it took me many years to work out this intense holy fire integrate it and use it for the betterment of the planet and everyone around me now here's the song and right after that the presentation Like a good bad thief, 
hanging on both sides of Yeshua. One goes to paradise, while the other one needs to live another life. Got shot, sending shivers down my spine, drinking what was once wine. I'm in the zone, as they say, the real presence in the tabernacle of the divine and dwelling. This is the abundant life, thanks to this holy electrocution, more than a spark, but a bolt of lightning. And no, not Lucifer falling from the sky. This is the lightning of love, igniting the divine romance, man's eternal quest for self realization. I'm a way station, never the eternal vocation. So, what are you waiting for, brothers and sisters? Climb aboard the fiery chariot, be a burglar rider, let the sand and descend, let the angels on Jacob's ladder. What's the matter? Live and die in the horizon. It's the way, the way of the master. In the introduction to this presentation, I mentioned uh, that I had a brush with danger and a massive kundalini awakening that was somewhat premature or that I was unready for. Though I was Roman Catholic at the time, since I was 15, I had been into Eastern thought, had heard of kundalini, but always dismissed it as being something of serpentine, of a serpentine nature, and therefore snakes and Satan are all one and the same. So we never really attempted to learn about it. We will, in following sessions, learn about kundalini serpent power, desire, fiery desire energy, that is. That's all it is. It gets its serpentine name, the coiled serpent name, because the energy travels in a pattern up through the spine and the chakras in a coiled configuration resembling a serpent or a snake. But as I said, I, I had been into Eastern thought and spirituality, including teachings on the chakras. But following the, my mystical illumination, my taste of enlightenment or heaven, what I can't dispute now was transfiguration and my complete dissolving of the material world in spontaneous samadhi, oneness, God contact, union. That lasted for several years, and, and it was evidenced in newfound psychic abilities. And yes, uh, I have to admit, quite a bit of astral phenomena. That was new, and I came to find out that astral phenomena is not really real down-to-earth enlightenment. And I say down-to-earth because my whole view on enlightenment has changed based on teachings that have come my way, spiritual teachers I've had the privilege of working with, being mentored by, helping me to see, as is taught in Buddhist traditions, that mindfulness and enlightenment are meant to be lived like a mundane mystic, in the ordinary, finding God in consciousness and presence, bringing presence, your present awareness to every moment and every conscious breath you take. Whether it's washing the dishes, taking out the dogs, studying for some course, it's endless where we can apply the divine presence in that frequency of enlightenment, of being illumined, but getting back to my experience, the outpouring and experiencing of that holy fire from heaven in a transmission or a diksha, as it's called in Hindu traditions, sent personally to me in gnosis or flashes of divine knowing, also called satori. Now, at the time, I was around 23 years old. And little did I know, but I was being re-divinized. Not that it wasn't divinized or born divine, but I was re-experiencing the process. Returning home, if you would, to the state of Edenic oneness, to the garden consciousness, where all abundance exists. During that immersion in the land of milk and honey, the promised land, the inner Jerusalem state, I was privy to what... Paramahansa Yogananda's 
line of gurus calls super consciousness or super conscious bliss. Sounds great, doesn't it? But what about the Christian teachings of being of Christ crucified? Joining your sufferings with Christ. Well, I don't find a whole lot of joy in suffering, considering that I have went through a very dark night of the soul and, and have now come out on the other end. Suffering is a result of madness, egoic madness. Yes, strict Orthodox Christian churches, the Roman Catholic Church, at least as has been seen throughout history, and also the Greek Orthodox Church, just to name two, they would have you suffer. Be that suffering servant and find no joy in your work. I once talked to a Greek Orthodox priest in my discernment of my calling to priesthood, and I told him I was joyous, and when he, told, when he responded to me in an email, he says, My son, you are not to embody joy. You are to be a suffering servant. Well, needless to say, you know, I've met many teachers and spiritual leaders who embody the old consciousness or a structure mentality that blocks the awareness of love's presence in my life. And that's all I was ever really looking for. And so I did. That, in summary, I did experience an influx of love, absolute love, the love of the allness. It was endless. I was consumed by it. It's the Song of Songs talks about it. it was truly a divine romantic experience. I haven't even had a sexual experience in my marriage. That compares to the climactic, the full body climactic experience I had during those many months. A false assumption about the Jews was that the land of the milk and honey was on a physical geographic map. It is within. That is the good news. The kingdom of heaven is not coming in a cloud. It's not here nor there. It's within. It's the Father principle, the divine indwelling. The statement the Father and I are one applies to all equally. During my awakening, everything glowed with light. I saw halos on holy people, and I began to predict things before they happened. Not that I consider the future to be written, but I think that many probabilities and many karmic patterns played themselves out in a script-like form, as in a projected reality, alternate reality, alternate dimension that the ego creates through an out-picturing process similar to the way a projection from a projector in a booth sends out a beam onto a screen in a movie theater. The ego outpictures this world and outpictures a universe for us to exist in. But really, there is only ever the moment of now. When you were in the past and an experience, good, bad, happy, sad, you were in the now. In the future, when you're on your deathbed, you will be in the now. Past and future are but psychological illusions put on a continuum and labeled as a linear reality. Time is a construct, a psychological construct in the mind, created by the mind. The now, the present, the ever-existing present, all there is, is eternal. We dwell in eternity, and we always will. And we always are. There is only one moment ever that is the holy instant. What we're talking about is spaciousness. And I've learned since that awakening experience to be the space in the presence of form, to have spaciousness within me. And ultimately, quantum physics teaches that, that 99.9% .9 of the body is made up of empty space. I remember Deepak Chopra teaching me that long before this awakening. Now, through a Roman Catholic devotion of adoration to the Blessed Sacrament, which is the body and blood of Jesus, that was a focalized way of being called deeper and deeper 
into the heart of God. I imagine that if I sat down and went through a benediction experience, a benediction prayer ceremony, and then sat or knelt or reclined in front of the Blessed Sacrament, now rather than staring into the center of the host that is housed in this golden, brilliant, very expensive instrument called the monstrance placed on the altar, I would probably close my eyes and gaze into the third eye, the Christ eye, the center of Christ consciousness. And what I was ultimately doing when I was magnetized by that focalized form of Christ consciousness, of, of divine consciousness on the altar, I was really, it was really acting as a mirror to what was already in me and what was emerging in me and rising in me. That kundalini was rising out of the depths of my unconsciousness and the self, the true self was emerging. It was a resurrection of life force, Easter consciousness. The eggshells of my ego had cracked. It was a crack in the cosmic egg of awareness, aliveness, a knowingness that is hard to put into words. Little did I know at the time that I was being called to follow Yeshua or Jesus, not to worship him but to follow the path to awakening, to truly follow him outside the bounds of religious piety, mind-made, man-made structure, hierarchy, religious legalism, beyond morality codes, beyond the need to worship in designated shrines and churches, to enact the same kind of prophetic reform of social religious institutions by ultimately making everyone accountable to God, not men, and through renouncing attachment to, to membership, to specialness, or the chosen religion syndrome. And I also had to let go of robotic ritual, mechanical actions, and jumping through hoops, trying to earn God through meritocracy. You can't earn God. I didn't earn that experience. It happened to me. Life happens to you. Divine life happens to you. Divine life is, it is, that's where the I am manifests from, that of which is, not was, but always has been. Now, I'm not saying that ritual is unnecessary. I happen to love it. And everyone has their own rituals, whether we realize it or not. And sometimes those rituals can become Obsessive or very self-grasping could be a product of our tentacles from our ego, our desires and our cravings projected outward into what might be called obsessive compulsive disorder in a manual that a statistical manual that diagnoses this disorder according to certain symptom climates, certain symptom manifestation over a given period of time. The life of an, of an obsessive compulsive person might appear real ritualistic, but it's anything but peaceful because anxiety drives OCD. And in my past, I had doctors tell me that's what was wrong with me because of excessive symptoms of fixation. So frustrated impulses and anxious impulses Rumination, thoughts, fragments in the mental stream or fragments and shattered itself images can lead to outpicturing or projecting outward our pain and then it manifests in our behavior. We want to nip all forms of fragmentation, all forms of schizoid tendencies, all forms of mental content and insanity, the insanity the insane nature of thought, of the thought of the ego's paradigm, the ego's script, the ego's world, the ego's grip, its fear, its separation frequency. It takes you out of the present moment. And it's like an obsessive compulsion who's constantly checking or hand washing, uh, uh, fearing uh, through hypochondria that they might get sick or contaminated by someone else's breath 
or handshake, or that the world might come crashing down if a cup is moved from a cupboard and put in another cupboard, or if it's left in the dishwasher, not cleaned fully before one uses it. We've all seen these people. And the reason that we know that they suffer so much is because we are those people. We seek to control our outer environment in many of the same ways that a person is, who is labeled with obsessive-compulsive disorder do. We get anxious when we can't control our environment or what's around us. When, we, when we're out of control or out of alignment inside, in our heart, in our, in our mind, everything is disjointed and everything is uh, in an anxious state called what Eckhart Tolle calls the anxiety gap that comes into the mental stream. When we live out of that anxiety gap and we, we experience dread, phobias, and fears, we're not in love. We're not living out of love. What we're doing is we're trying to construct and compensate for the void that we feel within by trying to, through projection, externalize our condition of suffering. And what we do is we impose that suffering and our need to try to reestablish control and order out of the chaos that is our thought process. We find things in the environment to, to become problems. We make our life in the world problematic through our own thinking and our own manifestations. We do it. OCD is a universal affliction. An egoic mental movie of terror and fear. And it's more pronounced in some people than in others. But nonetheless, we have to own that in order to be awakened to our real self. We make the hells we live in. The apparent ritualistic lifestyle of an obsessive-compulsive person stems again from anxiety from an afflictive emotion that might come from conditioning, ingrained mental tape recordings, voices, commands that lead one to act in a way that science calls abnormal or out of the ordinary from mainstream. And now what, you know, that calls to, calls to mind the question, what is ordinary? A state such as OCD or fixation and obsession and, and being unable to control one's impulses is not the ordinary divine state. It is part of the human condition, a part of us that seeks to convince ourselves, ourselves that we are more human, more creature-like, more mortal than our divine likeness to God.